Hello and good evening, friends. Today is the fifth talk in the master series of ACNS webinars. And for this concluding session of this month's webinar, we have a very, very special guest from China, Professor Ying Mao. Professor Ying Mao is the president of the prestigious Huashan Hospital, Fudan University. He is also serving as the president elect of the Chinese Neurosurgical Society. He was conferred the honorable title of Chung Kung Scholar for his outstanding contribution to neurosurgery by the Ministry of Education in China in 2015. He is the chief of Shanghai International Tian Kiao Shen Brain Research Institute with partners with California Institute of Technology, the United States. Professor Ying Mao is a very dedicated researcher who has published several manuscripts in various internationally peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely fortunate to have today with us Professor Ying Mao, who is going to share his vast experience in dealing with brainstem cavernomas. To chair this session of Professor Ying Mao, we have another distinguished faculty from Japan, Professor Akihide Kondo. Professor Kondo is the Chief Associate Professor in the Department of Neurosurgery, Juntendo University, Japan. He is also a very prominent figure in the Japanese Neurosurgical Society and is a specialist in adult and pediatric brain tumors and skull-based surgeries. He is also author of the several manuscripts published in variously international acclaimed journals. We are glad to have him today to chair this very special session about brainstem cavernomas. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I hereby welcome today's speaker, Professor Ying Mao, as well as the Chair, Professor Akihide Kondo, to this online platform of ACNS webinars. We are so fortunate that today we are joined by Professor Zubin, who is also from the Fudan University. Thank you, Professor, for coming. Dr. Liu Gunseng from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, may I please hand over the proceedings to Professor Akihi de Kondo. Thank you for your introduction. And uh, I'm pretty honored to having that, uh, this uh, uh, opportunity to uh, having that, uh, all the special new surgeons. And uh, also that uh, I would like to uh, have that uh, special lecture from that uh, Professor uh, uh, Mao. And uh, I'm looking forward to see that uh, good uh, lecture from him. So. Uh, Professor Mao, please start your lecture. Let me share the screen. So, uh, dear the, uh, the Raja and the dear Professor uh, Kondo and the dear colleagues from the uh, all over the world, it is my great honor to have the chance to share the experience about the surgical treatment of brainstem cavernoma. So, uh, I just coming from the uh, Department of uh, Neurosurgery of Huashan Hospital which is uh, one of the largest neurosurgical center in China. We have, uh, right now, we have 800 beds for neurosurgery and we have uh, 150 the neurosurgeons work, working in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the same department. So right now, so we have uh, more than 20,000 cases operated every year. So I think this, this is a big, uh, big uh, department. So that's why we, 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 we may have a lot of case. And also we have some, uh, uh, have some uh, problems and also may have some experience in the uh, surgical treatment of the cavernoma. So before my uh, introduction about uh, the uh, surgical uh, procedure, I think that we should understand why we should treat the cavernoma. The reason why we treat the cavernoma because the cavernoma may hemorrhage, hemorrhage in, uh, in the in the lifetime. We were according to the uh, the natural history of the cerebral cavernoma. We found that the uh, the annual hemorrhage rate for the cavernoma is uh, four to six percent every year. If we think that the cavernoma is coming from the uh, it, this is a, a congenital disease, but actually we, right now, so we understand that a lot of uh, cavernoma is not a, ca a congenital disease because uh, sometimes we have some different uh, situation caused the, uh, the cavernoma. For example, the gamma knife, or we call the radiotherapy, sometimes may cause the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cavernoma. So that's why we think that if we think that uh, the cavernoma is from the is a congenital disease, we think that the annual hemorrhage rate is four to six percent uh, every year. The second one is that we think that the uh, 
the cavernoma is uh, 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 is a uh, is some kind of, when the cavernoma have the uh, episode of hemorrhage, then the the patient may suffer the more uh, chance for the second hemorrhage. This the rehemorrhage risk is highest within the two to three years after the first episode. And also, when we review the uh, reference, we will find that the most uh, uh, the, the 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 second time of rehemorrhage is happened maybe eight months after the sec uh, the first episode. So we sometimes we use the episode, not hemorrhage. The reason is that sometimes the patient may not realize he suffered from the second hemorrhage because the patient maybe have some deterioration of the uh, neurological uh, function. But when we check the, uh, with the CT, um, uh, CT scan or MR scan, we will find the enlargement of the lesion or sometimes we will find the high density on CT scan, which may be uh, suggesting that the, uh, the patient suffer from the second hemorrhage, but it's very, uh, very mild. It's not very severe hemorrhage. But the second one is that if we just uh, check the uh, five year uh, risk for the, uh, uh, for the uh, cavernoma, it's uh, if the patient could not be treated, the follow up, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, hemorrhage rate is about 15.8%. And maybe the, uh, the hemorrhage rate is different uh, with the, uh, the, the location. If the cavernoma not located in the brainstem, it's about 3.8%. But if the hemorrhage located in the brainstem, it's a little bit higher, it's about 8%. But if the patient has suffered from the prior hemorrhage, the patient may be very high risk of rehemorrhage. It's about 78, 70 percent of the uh, rehemorrhage rate. And also the patient may be suffer from the uh, severe or new focal neurological deficit. So that's why we think that uh, uh, we try to understand the philosophy of the surgery of the cavernoma. We right now, so we 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 just uh, uh, just uh, uh, collecting all the uh, surgical mobility and mortality in, uh, worldwide. We will find that uh, in the experienced hand, the surgical mobility of uh, brainstem cavernoma is about five percent. Maybe the patient is suffer from the dipropia and maybe have some, uh, this, uh, it's have a numbness of the limb, but in the uh, uh, maybe unexperienced hands, the surgical mobility is uh, as high as 27.7%. And also we think that the, uh, the, this is the surgery in the brainstem. Then in the, in the experienced hand, they just uh, uh, declare, uh, 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 declare that there's no mortality but unfortunately, in the most of the surgeons, they think that uh, still we have uh, suffered from the mortality in the brainstem cavernoma surgery. For uh, the, in my experience, I also have uh, one patient die after the surgery, uh, one month after the surgery. So we think that still the, it's uh, not a very easy case and it's not very safe surgery. But at the same time, if we just compare the hemorrhage rate, we think that uh, uh, it's about uh, uh, 1% to 5% every year, and the rehemorrhage is uh, as high as to 70% every year. So that is the reason why we should have the surgery for the brainstem cavernoma. This is just an example for the, uh, for the conservative management of the brainstem cavernoma. This is a, an old, uh, it, it's, a, uh, it's the patient tried to see me maybe 20 years ago. At that time, the patient suffered from the uh, uh, first hemorrhage of the brainstem cavernoma. And I just uh, think about uh, this is uh, a deep seated cavernoma. So it is not very, uh, not very wise to have the surgery for such kind of patient. So that's why I just asked the patient to follow. 
and six months, uh, three months later, we can find the the lesion on the uh, on the MR scan, and then we think that this is a still it's a, a not very safe to have a surgery to remove the lesion. So that's why we just asked the patient to follow up again. Then six months, five months later, still have a, a lesion, and later we will find that this lesion uh, become a, a smaller and a smaller. And five, six years later, so we can find that uh, this is a very tiny lesion on the brain stem. So it means that for this patient, it is uh, not necessary to have the surgery to remove it. And this patient followed about uh, 20 years. So the patient is still very happy. There is no rehemorrhage. And the patient was uh, a very safe without uh, any kind of the surgical uh, the treatment. Okay, so that's why we, right now, so we think the uh, surgical indication for the brain stem is that the lesion just uh, reaching to the pure surface of the brain stem, and also the patient suffered from the repeated hemorrhage. And uh, uh, in our department, sometimes we think that it's more than two times. At that time, we should have the surgery. And also sometimes it's a deep-seated cavernoma, but it can be accessed via the surf entry zone. I will just uh, explain what, where is the safe entry zone later. And also the deep-seated cavernoma with rehemorrhage. And of course the patient have a very severe neurological deficit, or sometimes the patient maybe have some problem for respiratory function or have an impaired consciousness. So in such kind of situation, we think that the patient should receive the, uh, uh, the surgical treatment. And the purpose of the surgical treatment is that we try to prevent the further hemorrhage rather than neurological recovery. Because uh, sometimes we may uh, deteriorate the neurological function after the surgery. And the surgical strategy is that we try to balance the hemorrhagic mobility and the surgery related mobility. So it means that you, we try to have very, uh, uh, for the doctors, uh, try to understand yourself and try to understand your surgical ability, whether we can do harm to the patient or just to do good to the patient. And also we just review the, uh, the different opinion about the surgical timing. And this is a, uh, have a lot of controversy in the surgical, in the clinical experience. For example, in 2003, the, uh, Professor Wang, he is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the big boss in China neurosurgery, uh, Wang Zhongchen, at that time, he just uh, uh, suggested the patient should receive the surgery in the subacute stage. And also we will find that uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in a different literature that most of the uh, uh, neurosurgeons suggested the patient should have the surgery maybe in the subacute means that uh, it's just after four weeks uh, it's four weeks later after the uh, he re re hemorrhage. And sometimes we just uh, were, uh, wait until six months to uh, six weeks to eight weeks. But still have some, uh, some doctors suggested that we may have uh, uh, surgery at the acute stage. But still in 2015, Dr. Lawton also suggested that we may have the surgery in the acute stage and also in the subacute stage based on the uh, different uh, neurological function of the patient. And, but the, uh, the, uh, the data show that 60% of the patient in the uh, Lawton's team is within the eight, uh, eight weeks, means that still it's a, uh, it's a uh, acute and subacute stage. The reason why we should have the early surgery, the neurosurgeons pro the early surgery, they just suggested the patient maybe have some uh, neurological improvement. 
after the, uh, uh, the surgery in the acute stage. And also the, uh, the reason is that we can prevent the reactive gliosis because in the uh, chronic stage, the, uh, sometimes it's really hard to dissect the lesions from the uh, gliosis plane. And also uh, the, the doctor saying, um, maybe uh, agree that the, uh, the, it's maybe it's, uh, uh, it's we can avoid the uh, calcification dissection in the early stage. But still have some uh, doctors think that uh, we should have the subacute stage surgery because at that time, the patient's condition is stabilized. And also the hematoma is liquefied. And it's very easy for us to dissect the plane between the lesion and the brain tissue, brainstem tissue. And at that time, the reactive gliosis is not uh, likely to, uh, to have at that time. And also it's very easy to achieve the m resection of the lesions. And the furthermore is that we can have a, a better uh, differ differentiations on the MR scan to, to find the, the uh, hematoma and to differentiate between the hematoma and the lesions. But still have some neurosurgeons think that we, uh, we don't think it's uh, necessary or it's not, uh, good, uh, it's not good to have the surgery in the early stage. Because at that time, the patient maybe have a very severe neurological deteriorations and sometimes they have a very severe brainstem edema. So it is really hard at that time to identify the dissection plane. And also it's uh, have a very high recurrence because we, at that time, we really hard to find the, the total, the entire lesions in the early stage. So right now, so we think that the surgical principle is that for, uh, if we can, uh, we should have the early operation just after the lesion can be clearly demonstrated on the MR. And the second one is that we can, and we, uh, uh, we are make sure, uh, we make sure that we can have a complete uh, cavernoma resection. And also we can have the uh, deep bulk, uh, we can deep bulk the lesion and we can remove the entire lesion with the capsule. Sometimes we have some capsule, uh, uh, we cannot remove the total, the entire capsule may cause the, uh, the recurrence of the lesion. And also sometimes we uh, should have the aggressive explorations if the uh, lesion is a lobulate cases. And for the yellow stain glio, uh, gliotic C tissue, we should preserve. And especially in the situation where we have the, uh, uh, the DVA, means that the, uh, the, the venous and malformation, at that time, we should carefully protect that. Uh, we could not remove that totally with the cavernoma. And sometimes it's really hard to have a homeostasis for the, uh, for the uh, venous malformation. And, uh, the second one is we just think about the uh, designing the surgical approach. There are two principles for the, uh, for the designing the surgical approach. The first one is that let the lesion do the talk, talking. Means that we try to, uh, uh, because the lesions can be determining the timing of the surgery and also the goals of the surgery. And so that's why we think that we try to understand the lesions for the uh, understand the individual lesions for everyone, uh, for every cases. The second principle is try to build approach from the inside out. It means that we should start it to have uh, located the, the center of the lesion. And then we try to design it to uh, find the, the safe entry zone. And then we continue to the trajectory and try to have the craniotomy uh, uh, later. So this is a try to uh, explain uh, why we should have the, the, uh, the leasing uh, decision. So this is a, the first one we try to understand the center uh, or try to locate the center of the lesion. And then we try to find the 
safe entry zone on the surface of the brainstem. And then we try to design, uh, we try to draw the line. And this is the uh, surgical approach. And the second one is that when the lesion can be approached from the latter side, you'd better to have the latter side approach rather than in the, from the, uh, the middle line. So we usually prefer for, uh, 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 for such kind of a principle to, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the surgical approach designing. We call it a two-point method. So this is just the, the uh, where can I find the safe entry zone. Now this is just the, the paper uh, published on the Journal of Neurosurgery in 2017, and it's well illustrated the uh, uh, safe entry zone for the brainstem cavernoma, we will find that uh, from the different areas, we, we may find a different uh, location for the entry zone. And we try to have the vertical incision on the brainstem. This is uh, very important for the uh, brainstem uh, surgery. And we can see that the, uh, this is a safe entry zone. This is for the midbrain we can on the uh, dorsal surface of the uh, midbrain, and we can find that this is the uh, safe entry zone. And for the pons, we can have the uh, uh, entry zone, it's just uh, on the lateral side, and we can find it's just, uh, uh, you try to find the, uh, the, uh, v, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the trigeminal nerve, and just above it and just below it, you will find this is the entry zone, for the pawns. And also, this is just for the uh, medullary uh, uh, brainstem. You can find this is the safe entry zone for such kind of lesions. And the, also, we can use the, some uh, advanced technology. The uh, one the technology is that we can use the DTR of the MR and try to visualize the, the fiber tracking uh, of the brainstem. And we can decide uh, which uh, which way or uh, which side should we have the surgical approach, and this is just a, a good example. So we have the lesions just in the palms, and we just have a DTR, and we will find that the DTR just uh, at the uh, lateral side of the lesions. Maybe we can from the uh, we can remove these lesions from the anterior part or from the posterior part, but it's not from the lateral part. And also the mapping and the monitoring of the pyramidal tracking is sometimes very useful, especially for the uh, nucleus. When we have the, uh, for the fissure follicles, the, we can use the, uh, the stimulation and try to understand we can uh, preserve the, the fissure nerve. And also for, uh, this is just an example. If we just, uh, 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 design the surgical approach according to the location of the lesions. In the midbrain, we prefer the transylvian fissure, subtemporal approach, or, or trans uh, optozygomatic approach, or we call, use the, the uh, uh, supracellabella uh, super super and the uh, approach, or sometimes we use the open approach. And for the lesions located in the pons, Richard sigmoid approach is, uh, uh, is suggested for such kind of lesions. And also for the, on the dorsal surface of the fourth ventricle, the suboccipital midline approach is suggested. And for the uh, lesions in the uh, medullary, we can use the lateral supracondral approach or suboccipital midline approach for such kind of lesions. So this is uh, just a, a, a summarize about the uh, the mostly used approach according to the uh, location of the lesions. And we can use the ventral part approach or the lateral part. Also, we can use the dorsal part approach and we can use the trans approach and the retro sigmoid approach, far lateral approach, all kind of approach we can use according to the location of the lesion. This is just an example. We use the uh, uh, trans approach. This is a 68 years old right-handed male, and the patient suffered from the uh, 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 suffered from the, uh, the some lesions five months ago, 
So it means that this is in the, uh, not in the acute stage, but in the uh, chronic stage, because the patient come to our department uh, very late. At that time, so we just uh, understand that this is a lesion in the uh, anterior part of the pores. So that's uh, in the mid-brain. Uh, mid so that's why we just have a DTR to analyze that it's really hard for us to, uh, to remove the two, uh, lesions according to the lateral uh, approach. So we, we think that we can use the anterior approach to remove the lesions. So we use the uh, transsylvian approach and we just uh, split the, uh, uh, the, the brain uh, cerebral fissure and try to expose the anterior part of the uh, uh, brain, uh, of the brainstem. And we use the stimulation, try to avoid some uh, uh, cranial nerve coming out from the brainstem. And actually we realized that uh, we can find, this is some, uh, 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 the yellow stain and we think that the lesion may be just a bit, uh, beneath the, uh, the, the lesions. But sometimes we think that it is uh, very important that we try to use the navigation to understand. Sometimes it's not very, uh, it's not very accurate to, according to the yellow stain uh, brain tissue. But for this case, it's okay. And we can find the lesions according to the uh, navigation and then try to remove the lesions in the anterior surface of the uh, brainstem. And we try to remove the lesions uh, embryo, but it's uh, sometimes it's really hard to remove the embryo. And we, you try to understand the, uh, some capsule, and the capsule sometimes is transparent, and you should remove it. And for this one, we can remove the lesion and then this is just the, uh, the uh, ICA, uh, ICA. During the surgeries, we use the SEP and MEP to uh, monitor the uh, function, the motor function of the brain. Now how about the subtemporal approach? This is a 60, uh, 46 years old uh, female and patients suffer from the, uh, the weakness of the extremities. And we understand that this is a lesion just in the lateral, anterior lateral side of the brainstem. It's just uh, uh, in the junction of the midbrain and the pulse. So it's a little bit higher. So that's why we think that we can remove it from the subtemporal approach to remove that. And we also have the DTR and showed that the DTR just the inside of the lesions. So we use the uh, subtemporal approach. And we just uh, split the, uh, 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 sometimes we can remove the, uh, uh, so, uh, the uh, so resect, uh, some resection on the, the ten, uh, tentorial ridge. And then we can expose the lateral side of the uh, brainstem and we can find the lesions. And sometimes there are some hematoma inside. So remove the uh, hematoma is uh, just uh, one part, and we try to explore the, uh, the entire capsule of the cavernoma. And this is just the after surgery, the CT scan after surgery. And we find that the patient maybe have some problems about the, uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the motor function, but finally, the patient have the uh, very good uh, modified ranking scale after the surgery. So how about the uh, far lateral approach? So this is a, a very tiny cavernoma in the surface of the brain, of, of the medullary. And uh, the patient has a diapropio and also have the numbness of the limb and is aggravated because the patient has suffered from the second episode of hemorrhage. So we decided to have uh, uh, removed this lesion and we just have a DTR and you will find that the technology of the DTR is improved gradually with the, uh, uh, with the development of the MR technology. And we can find that this is a lesion and we used a far lateral approach and to expose 
there is uh, enough space for the uh, uh, for the lesions in the medullary, but it should be careful. It's a very deep seated lesions, and it's very small, and you should remove it uh, carefully. And this one, we uh, I can amplify remove of the lesions. and try to remove the entire capsule of the lesion. And this is a four months after surgery and the, 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 the lesion is a disappear. And this is after almost the two years later, we will find that the lesion is almost removed. So the patient have a very good recovery after the surgery. So retrosigmoid uh, approach is a very common approach for the uh, lesions in the pulse. For example, in this case, the patient is suffer from the uh, uh, headache and also have a dipropia and working instability. So they have a, a huge uh, hematoma and we suggest that this is a cavernoma in the pulse. So we use the uh, retrosigmoid approach for this patient. And this is a T1, show this a huge lesions with the uh, lobular uh, formation, it's huge. And we have a DTR and demonstrated the, the, uh, the, uh, the intact of the fiber track with the DTR technology. And we use the retrosigmoid approach And this is the uh, lateral side of the pulse. And we, and in such kind of lesions, sometimes we use the navigation and try to know the accurate location of the lesion. And then we just have the vertical incision and try to expose the, uh, the, the cavernoma. So the cavernoma in such kind of uh, uh, type, it's, uh, it's have uh, some breedings. And also it's uh, very sticky to the surface of the brain, uh, of the brainstem. And this is just uh, some uh, lobe of the capsule. And you try to remove piece by piece. So this is after surgery. And how about the uh, supracellabella infratentoria approach? This, uh, uh, I strongly suggest such kind of approach for the lesions in the midbrain. For example, this is uh, the lesion in the midbrain and you can go in the, uh, the, uh, cerebral, uh, the split the cerebral fissure from the anterior part, or you can remove it from the uh, subtemporal approach but for the pulse, we think that uh, the the, uh, the supracellular approach is a it's a really good one. And this one, we just have a DTR. It's really hard to approach the lesions from the subtemporal approach. And this is just the location of the lesions. So we use the uh, supracellular approach. It's a pyramid line, it's not in the middle line, just to use the pyramid line. And we just have a vertical uh, approach, a vertical incision, and it's a deep seated one. It's about uh, one centimeter beneath uh, uh, the, the surface of the, uh, uh, of the brainstem. And then we find the lesion and try to have uh, embryonic uh, resection of the lesions. And this is for the deep seated lesions, it's very important. Sometimes you, you may leave something inside and have the uh, recurrence after surgery. So this is just to remove the lesions. And this is just the after surgery. And sometimes we can use the Popen approach 
this is just uh, according to the preference of the uh, doctors. For example, this one, it's, uh, uh, we can use a different approach for such kind of lesions. And the patient has suffered from the first hemorrhage in 2017. Uh, and the patient uh, just uh, have a, a deterioration uh, two months later. And then we try to use the Popen approach for such kind of lesions. And this is just the uh, uh, position for the patient. And we use the uh, uh, neural navigation to try to have the uh, uh, lesion uh, uh, drawing on the uh, surface uh, of, the, uh, of the head. And, and we use the Popen approach. This is the, the, uh, the Dura, the Sagittal view, and we can uh, have uh, incision and to expose the midbrain, and we can find that this is the uh, the yellow staining brain tissue, and try to expose the lesion, and we can find the uh, the hematoma, and the capsule. Sometimes we can find some uh, 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 vessels. But actually, the uh, vessel, the, uh, the hemostasis is not the big problem for the cavernoma resection. It's, uh, we don't find some uh, very huge breedings in the, in the surgery. And this is just to remove the lesion. after surgery. So the old patient, we, we just have the patient mostly is uh, coming to our department, maybe in the uh, chronic stage, maybe uh, six, uh, three to six months later, because the patient could uh, maybe have to uh, stay in the other hospital until the patient can recover. But still we have some emergency one. So how about the acute surgery for the repeated hemorrhage of, uh, of the brainstem cavernoma? So we just have a, a lot of case is that the patient just come to see us within the three weeks. The patient, because uh, the patient maybe suffered from some problems of the respiratory function or some patient may be in the coma. So for this patient, we right now, so our opinion is that we try to remove the lesions if the patient have a uh, gradually deterioration of the consciousness or some of the brain uh, neurological function. So how about the uh, suboccipital mid uh, midline uh, approach? This is a commonly used approach for the, uh, for the, uh, brain, uh, uh, for the cavernoma in the brainstem, especially on the dorsal surface of the uh, uh, palms. So this is a 15 years of female. The patient has suffered from the first episode of hemorrhage in 2016. And then maybe several months later, the patient has suffered, have a very uh, severe, the second episode of hemorrhage. And the patient have a, a third episode uh, just uh, one day after the second episode. So patients have a deterioration of the neurological uh, uh, function. So we try to have the uh, uh, emergency surgery and try to remove the lesions through the midline approach, suboccipital midline approach, and to expose that. So the technology we use, the techniques we use is try to have the stimulation in the surgery and try to preserve the fissure nerve just coming from uh, coming out uh, just to come out from the uh, the brainstem and we just uh, remove the lesions and also we just uh, uh, four years later we find that the patient have a, a, a very good recovery after the surgery this is just the after surgery we, the patient suffer from the uh, no breeze difficult but the patient have suffered from some, uh, uh, some uh, new, neurological deficit, for example, the facial palsy. 
So for the lower medulla rate, we just use the suboccipital midline approach. So this is the case, just to suffer from the hemorrhage in the lower uh, medulla rate. And uh, it's just a, in the, uh, it's a deep seated and it's uh, in the midline of the medulla rate. We have the, uh, uh, the SWI sequence and also we have the, uh, uh, the DTR to show the relationship between the fiber tract and the lesions. So for this one, it's uh, uh, ex exposed the lesion is not very difficult because we use the routine way and we will find that the lesion is just beneath the, uh, the yellow stain, the, the tissue. But actually in this uh, uh, area, so it's very difficult and sometimes it's very dangerous. So you have to carefully dissect the lesion uh, without any kind of the coagulation. And try to dissect the plane and to expose the capsule. Sometimes the, the capsule is sticky to the, uh, this, uh, the brainstem. So you have to use, uh, to carefully dissect it. So this is uh, the after surgery and we just uh, follow up the patient and the MR scan showed the lesion is totally removed four years later. So this is just uh, the uh, clinical features for the patient uh, uh, treated by, by Cyril. The patient maybe have some uh, respiratory, uh, uh, respiratory failure. This is just uh, for the acute uh, surgery or the, for the emergency surgery for the patient, something like this. And also my personal experience of the brain stain cavernoma uh, two years uh, late, uh, two years before is about uh, it's over 100, and we just uh, find that all the patient maybe have improvement with the uh, uh, with the less modified ranking scale after the surgery. Uh, this is just a follow up for almost uh, three to four years, and the patient mostly the uh, uh, hemiparesis can be approved improved in the 50 percent of the patient. And cranial neural deficit is improved in the 40%. The sensory disturbance is really hard for recovery. It's only about 16%. And for the cranial nerve deficit, it's, a, it's really easy for, uh, for recovery for the uh, abducens nerve. But the oculomotor nerve is really hard for, uh, for the recovery after the surgery. And for the aphasia, the patient can have a totally or full recovery after the surgery. So this is a, just a, a suggestion, uh, some uh, a clinical experience uh, of the uh, brainstem cavernoma. So what my suggestion is that the surgical resection remains the, the primary option to treat brainstem cavernoma after the careful patient selection. The second one is that the preoperative MR is required for diagnosis of brain stain without pathological examinations. The third one is that uh, determining the surgical approach case by case according to a different brain stain cavernoma location by two points method, or we just uh, according to the safe entry zone to design the surgical approach. DTI is very useful, and sometimes we use the uh, uh, monitoring during the surgery is still very useful. We can use the mapping or the monitoring of the fiber tracking. And also sometimes we can use the stimulation to localize the, uh, the efficient nerve on the dorsal surface of the, uh, uh, of the pulse. And we may have some improvement or to preserve the efficient nerve after the surgery. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much about that, uh, your wonderful lecture. Uh, 
Ruth Amao, you are so marvelous. But uh, still, I, I, I think that he already like showed us that uh, the concept of the the uh, normal surgery in the brainstem, and also he mentioned something about the, the indication of the surgery, and also he explained about that uh, what's a good timing for the surgery, and also well, he showed that uh, he's like a uh, wonderful surgical techniques and uh, he already like uh, uh, controlling that the older surgical approaches for the double stem surgery so if there is there any question from the, the audience yeah i think we'll just open topic for discussion thank you very much professor mao for showing us such excellent approaches towards brainstem and uh, your philosophy regarding management of uh, brainstem cavernomas we are so glad that uh, we had so much to learn from you today. So may I please invite uh, Professor Zubin to say a few words? Actually, uh, Professor Mao's uh, presentation is fantastic. And uh, he is my uh, teacher on the brainstem uh, cavernomas resection. Actually, I rem still remember very clear that uh, uh, I have a very difficult case uh, on the, uh, at the junction area of uh, uh, midbrain and the pons and uh, the uh, it's a, a young boy and uh, the neural uh, deficit is uh, deteriorate very fast and uh, the patient have a second time uh, hemorrhage and uh, we choose uh, uh, resect it uh, immediately at the acute stage and the patient recovered very well and just like a miracle you know when the uh, patient come in, he, he, he would lie down and, uh, on the bed. And uh, when she go out, he has walked, he walked out. So it's like a miracle. Yeah. I think that the, I just noted about that from the, the question on the chat. And uh, somebody asked you, I want to ask you about that. Uh, do you use that some like an intraoperative MRI or ultrasound or something like that? Uh, like a, a procedure to identify that the exact location of the, the cavernoma? Um, uh, this is a really good question. For the brainstem, it's not necessary to use the intraoperative MR because it's a very tiny lesion and uh, we can find it according to the anatomical uh, landmark. But for the uh, cavernoma in the, uh, uh, in the hemisphere, sometimes it's really hard, especially for the multiple lesions. When you try to remove one, and you will have some uh, a shift. So sometimes you, you were really hard to find the second one. So in this situation, we just uh, suggest uh, uh, to have the uh, uh, tube. Use the tube to, uh, with, the, uh, with the help of the navigation and try to localize the first one. And then we can remove the second one first. Then we come back and to, uh, to remove the second one but, uh, according to the, uh, the tube, the, the, uh, according to the course of the tube and to remove the second one. So I think that uh, the ultrasound technology is not very uh, useful for the uh, removal of the cavernoma, although uh, the, the imaging on the ultrasound is very clear for the cavernoma. But I think that uh, right now we can use the navigation it's a really good one. Just in case, if you don't have the navigation, you can use the ultrasound. It's very useful for the cavernoma, especially for the cavernoma. Okay, thank you for a good comment about that. So I have a one, just one question about the, the surgical timings. Actually, the, you have the tons of the cases of the, the, this type of the, the cavernoma, but uh, I just always like wondering that what's the best timing for the patient. So mm -hmm. oh, I believe that there, you know, oh, you know something about the, the timing. So I just want to ask you one question, which is your favorite time to remove the, the cover normas? <laughs> yeah, my, uh, my philosophy maybe changed gradually within these 20 years. So at that time, maybe 20 years ago, I think that uh, uh, it's a good way to remove the lesion in the subacute stage, means uh, uh, three to four weeks after the hemorrhage. I think that uh, the reason is that, uh, is that we, we may uh, try to clearly localize the lesion and try to dissect the uh, capsule carefully, or uh, it's, uh, maybe it, this is a, uh, it's a good way in the subacute stage. But and the second reason is that 
we still just think that maybe some patients the uh, maybe have some uh, 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 self cure maybe it's uh, it's uh, just a shrink after the second episode uh, first the second uh, first episode so that's why we have to wait maybe 6 to 8 weeks and try to have the mr scan again and think that maybe it's a shrink we don't need a surgery just observation but right now the more and more patient with the very severe uh, clinical condition come to our department. So I think that if the patient have a very huge hemorrhage, I suggest that, that to remove the uh, lesion in the acute stage is uh, a good way. Okay, thank you. Yes, Professor Marcus Wagner, you can ask your question directly. Oh, yeah. professor. Many greetings, Professor. Nice to have your class here. And I want to know if you use a supracerebellar infratentorial approach for thalamic region like Puvinar. Are you accustomed to these approaches? Mm. Ceramus, uh, the, the lesions in the ceramus uh, is uh, uh, it's a very difficult one. It's because it's a deep seated. So we have uh, different locations for such kind of lesions. So uh, in the posterior part, of the ceramus, we can use the supracerebellar approach. But sometimes, uh, just in the ceramus, it's close to the uh, uh, ventricle, we just uh, use the uh, uh, transventricular approach, or sometimes we use the uh, uh, popen approach. I think that uh, uh, it's just uh, according to the location of the lesions in the ceramus. Professor Hidehito Kimura. Oh, hello, uh, and Professor Mao. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. And, uh, uh, how are you? <laughs> I was seeing you on the yeah the Chinese meeting. So uh, thank you for an excellent presentation and showing a uh, different uh, surgical approach to the different location to the brainstem cavernoma. You achieved an excellent uh, outcome to the all patient, almost all patient. Yeah, it's amazing for me. So it may be I have one question for you. It may be uh, an impolite question for you, but it's my it's my great interest. The, for the patient, the worsening of the post-operative deterioration, mm -hmm. post-operative deterioration of the, of the patient. Actually, mm -hmm. you have some patient uh, encounter the post-operative deterioration, worsening mm -hmm. of the neurological, uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. neurological status. But can mm -hmm. you expect the outcome of the patient preoperatively, or uh, yeah, yes, yeah. can you expect the uh, result of the deterioration? Pre yeah, yeah, this is a, a really good question. I still remember the first case I operated 20 years ago, and uh, the patient just have a lesion in the uh, in the in the pulse. I removed the lesion, but the patient recovered very well. But the patient still suffered the, the uh, inability of the uh, movement. Still 20 years later, so yeah. that's why I think that uh, uh, it is. Uh, that's why I think that we should have to. Uh, should have to select uh, uh, the uh, select some patient for observation, not yeah. for the older patient to have the surgery. And also the uh, uh, for the uh, 100 cases, we still find that uh, a lot of patients suffer from the uh, the uh, severe deterioration after the surgery. But yeah. it's very interesting that the patient can be recovered very well, maybe one to two months later. So I think that, that this reason is that because of the uh, some uh, 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 surgical manipulations and some uh, uh, some 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 swell, uh, swellings of the brainstem, but still the a lot of patient can re recover. Most of the patient yeah. can recover. So we just we published our papers on the neurosurgery uh, ten years ago. At that time, we just carefully analyzed the uh, neuro ne neurological functions after the surgery. Yes, almost your worsening is uh, temporary. Just so, just after yeah. the, uh, just a, yes, amount of, just a period of, of time, the temporary worsening you mentioned. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question for Professor Mao. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, Professor Mao, you just mentioned that the venous malformation uh, should be kept intact uh, precisely. So, yeah. uh, so is this a uh, spec you should uh, uh, consider preoperatively uh, to uh, keep it intact 
so choose the uh, uh, approach mm -hmm. yes uh, precisely yeah because sometimes it's uh, uh, the the uh, the relation uh, of the covenant malformation and the venous malformation was not fixed yes sometimes it's uh, in the upper world or midline or mm -hmm. outside so, uh, so. My explanation of the mechanism of the cavernoma is that not the, uh, this is just the, uh, uh, something like uh, uh, AVM. This is a, something like a venous malformation. We think that mm -hmm. uh, when we have the uh, thrombos in the venous uh, structure, in structure, uh, the structure, then we will gradually have the venous malformation, and then we have the cavernoma. So that's why we can carefully a check on the MR scan, and we can find the venous malformation uh, accompanied with the ca uh, cavernoma. So that's why we, before the surgery, we can understand the anatomical uh, and uh, uh, the location of the venous malformation uh, to the uh, to the cavernoma, and we try to design the surgical approach to avoid the uh, uh, damage of the venous malformation. But sometimes we still have to, uh, we, we find the mal ma venous malformation just in the surgery. And that times you should be carefully preserve it because you will find that a very strong the, uh, venous structures in, uh, just close to, adjacent to the uh, cavernoma. At that time, you never try to use the coagulation to uh, try to remove that. And you try to preserve that. Yeah, this is my experience, right? Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, we have Professor Takayuki Hara with us. Well, uh, thank you, Professor. I have one question. I have never experienced, but uh, uh, some my colleagues said uh, during surgery we experienced cardiac arrest uh, for brainstem cavernoma. Have you experienced such a kind of uh, such a complication during surgery, cardiac arrest? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a uh, sometimes we when we have the lesions in the medullary. We yeah. try to let the patient have uh, uh, his respiratory uh, function come back, and we just let them have uh, uh, the self-respiratory uh, respiratory uh, the function, and then we just have to explore the lesions. So yeah. this how is about the bradycardia. Uh, uh, how did I, I never experienced such kind of. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. So no, do you do you think do do you not do you think you don't have to um, prepare like pacing? No pacing. Uh, actually, we just let the uh, monitor to have a very loud uh, sound and try to uh, monitoring the uh, the heartbeat. And sometimes when you explore the lesions, sometimes you find that the uh, the uh, not a, uh, not normal abnormal heart rate during the surgery. So at that time, mm -hmm. you have to stop. Yeah, well, I, yeah. for such kind of things, I just uh, experienced several times. But not mm -hmm. the uh, cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. Just the okay. Uh, uh, right. yeah. okay. Thank you so much. Yes, my friend, Dr. Itiche. Hello, uh, uh, Professor Mao. I am Itiche from Thailand. So, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation about the difficult and several approach in everywhere about the best stem cavernoma. Uh, I have two questions to ask you. Uh, from my experience to surgery about the best stem cavernoma, I uh, met some problems. Uh, for the first one, during I remove the cavernoma, it's uh, in the last region, it's very really difficult to remove by the, the pitch mill because it's really thick and it's, uh, it's difficult to cut in the subacute state. Do you have uh, any experience or recommend to use uh, the CUSA to remove the cavernoma? And the second question, uh, once we uh, 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 try to uh, find about the brain or the capsule from the cavernoma and bend stem, in some time, it's very difficult to find about the, the pain. So, I leave some the capsule of the cavernoma that attached to be attached to the brain stem. So how how do you recommend to to leave it or just only just 
only follow or uh, how to avoid about the recurrent carbonoma? Thank you, Professor Mao. Okay, good question. Uh, uh, for me, I when I just try to explore the lesions, I never use the bipolar. And the second one, never use the, uh, uh, the CUSA, the aspirator, because it's uh, maybe have some damage to the, uh, to the brainstem tissue. So I think that uh, the uh, uh, forceps is very useful and try to use the tiny, uh, and you have the tiny, uh, the, the, use the tiny stress and uh, be patient and try to remove the capsule uh, piece by piece and I don't think it, if you find a lesion, you try to remove it totally. Otherwise, you will suffer from the recurrent of the lesions. So I, I just have an experience about the two cases of recurrent. So I still think about maybe at that time, for the first time, I could not remove the capsule totally. So that's why the patient is suffering from the recurrence. And it's a really, uh, it's a, it's a really not good for the patient to have a second uh, surgery because this is a brain stem. Mm -hmm. So I think that I prefer to explore the capsule and try to remove it totally. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for a very clear answer. Thank you, Professor. Yes, Dr. Ajit yeah, Singha. Yeah. yeah, it was an excellent presentation, Doctor, and it was interesting also. So. Since it is interesting, obviously we have few questions. I wanted to ask you that uh, uh, to to look into the blind spot, do you use uh, intraoperative uh, endoscopy uh, after removal of the cavernoma? That is question number one. And question number two is that uh, if we use intraoperative navigation, then after the CSF is drained and once you are, uh, you know, uh, their brain can their brain can shift a little bit, and so uh, as you said, for the remnant cavernoma, you can use the neuro navigation that can give a, a false uh, impression about it. What is your experience about that? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the second question is still that uh, we whether we can use the neuro navigation for the uh, uh, just in the situation of the brain shift. So. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I think that uh, for the two lesions, it's, uh, it will be very easy. I just explained uh, the, the, before that you can use the, uh, 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 a tool, try to localize the one of them. And then you try to use a uh, navigation to localize the second one and to remove the second one and then come back to just uh, according to the two and try to find the lesions. But for the, uh, if the patient is suffer from three or four or more, it, it will be very difficult. And at that time, the uh, ultrasound is still very useful to find the additional lesions. So this is my uh, experience. And the, uh, the second, the first one is that for the uh, intraoperative endoscope, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, this is my philosophy is that uh, uh, endoscope will be the future, but actually exoscope will be the future. Endoscope can be used for the uh, lesions in the deep seated area, but I think that uh, right now we have the small craniotomy with the help of the levigation. I think that uh, with the uh, microscope, we, uh, that's enough for us to remove the cavernoma, and it may take uh, uh, less time to find the lesions. So I don't think that uh, intraop uh, the endoscope can uh, yeah. help. The, uh, I think that right now, so we try to have a new approach for the, uh, the lesions located in the anterior part of the lesions. At that time, so we can use the uh, uh, transnasal approach and try to use the endoscope to, uh, to remove the lesions just through the uh, transnasal approach. It will be very useful for the uh, lesions in the anterior part of the uh, brainstem. So okay. still we think that the endoscope can be useful. Yes, Dr. Patsarthi that. Uh... Thank you, Professor Mao for your wonderful lecture. One case of cavernous malformation, cavernoma in the brainstem, I approached through the midline suboccipital approach 
and the patient was very nice in the post operative period but after four or five days the patient deteriorated so we found that there is some hematoma in the cavity and there is some reactive hydrocephalus if that is the situation and the patient deteriorates in the post operative period and you find a hematoma in the cavity and hydrocephalus so will you go and do a, a evd and wait or you will re explore the hematoma it's a this is a, a, a very uh, difficult to answer that uh, the uh, usually for the cavernoma in the breast then if you have some uh, 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 breedings in the cavity after surgery i don't think we try to remove the cavity uh, the the hematoma uh, again i think that it can be absorbed because in these areas it could not be have a very high pressure uh, lesions uh, after the surgery so i don't think it's uh, you have to remove that just in case the patient have a deteriorate of the uh, neuro neurological uh, function for the breast and especially in the uh, uh, on the surface of the uh, fourth ventricle just if the patient is suffer from hydrocephalus i think that we have we may have a, a extra a, a external drainage for the uh, csf just uh, uh, maybe in the uh, one month because the patient maybe have some uh, improvement of the hydrocephalus one or two months later so we may have a, a external drainage of the csf Okay. Uh, usually, yeah, yeah. I just uh, have a further explanation that uh, for the uh, acute stage, we just uh, prefer have the uh, I, uh, CSF for drainage uh, just uh, at the same time for uh, with the surgery. It maybe have some uh, in, uh, improvement for the uh, for the function. Would you like to ask your question? I just Please. want to know the the role of uh, intraoperative monitoring to localize the lesion. This is a good question is that uh, actually, first of all, we think that the uh, monitoring is not, uh, the, the, for the uh, monitoring of the brainstem function is very important. So MEP is very important, the monitoring during the surgery. And sometimes when we explore the lesions and try to uh, dissect the lesions, sometimes we may have some problems about uh, only uh, for, the, uh, for the decrease of the, uh, uh, of the wave uh, on the MEP. So at that time, you should have to wait until the, the recovery of the wave, and then we can have the, uh, the, uh, the further explorations. And the other one is uh, what I used is the uh, stimulation. This is a, a, a small technology. It's uh, very tricky because we see that the brainstem is cannot be monitoring or cannot have some function when you have the electro stimulation on the surface of the brain, uh, of the brainstem. But actually, we understand that the, uh, the cranial nerve coming from the brainstem. So when he just come from out of the brainstem, you, we can stimulate that. So that's why we usually use such kind of technology to monitor the fissure nerve, because it's uh, coming from the su uh, surface, the dorsal surface of the uh, brainstem. So sometimes we use such kind of technology to to try to preserve the fission nerve. Okay. May I please uh, ask Professor Mao Ying that uh, you said you would, uh, you showed one of the cases where you use subtemporal approach to brainstem cavernomas. Do you always cut the tentorium along with the subtemporal approach to expand your corridor? Okay. Yeah, the, for, for that case, you were sure that I just uh, have some, uh, uh, some mistake. Because I just uh, cut the, uh, the 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 cochlear nerve when I try to have the uh, 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 the cutting of the aid uh, of the tentoria. So sometimes, if you want to have the subtentoria approach, you have to be careful. And the second one is that you have to cut the tentoria because you you have if you want to explore the lateral part of the uh, brainstem, you have to. Otherwise, you have a very narrow space. Right. And uh, for the so much of retraction of the temporal lobe, do you use a preoperative lumbar drain to relax the brain? For the subtemporal approach, if you, uh, we, sometimes we use the, uh, uh, the middle fossa approach. At that time, when we use the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the extra dura approach, in such case, we use the drainage. 
But if this is an intro, the uh, Dura approach, we can firstly to expose the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the arachnoid space. So we can have leave some uh, uh, CSF out. So for this case is to have a very, uh, very relaxed of the uh, brain surface. So we don't need the, uh, the, the drainage for the intra temporal approach. Do you, do you use, Professor Mao, do you use methyl prednisolone in the post-operative period? Okay, post -operative. Uh, we never use the steroid after the surgery. Even in the, brain, in the trauma case, we never use the uh, uh, steroids for, uh, for, the, uh, for the brainstem surgery. We can go back to Professor Atide Kondo for his uh, final conclusion. I think that uh, we have a good discussion about that, uh, uh, you know, brainstem carbonoma. And uh, I, I have to say that, uh, you know, Professor Mao's uh, presentation is wonderful. And he, he always like answers clearly about the, the all our question. So oh, thank you very much for that. Uh, you are uh, wonderful lecture and a wonderful answer. Uh, so we are just uh, uh, now uh, very much studied about the brain stem carbonoma and we should, we can use the, this kind of information to the uh, tomorrow's clinical uh, procedures. Thank you again. Uh, we will wind up this session. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of CU Kukato, I would like to thank today's speaker, Professor Mao Ying for coming here and giving us an, a very elaborate talk about the various approaches and his philosophy regarding management of brain scavernomas. I also thank today's uh, Chair Professor Akhti De Kondo who joined us for this uh, very informative discussion. Thank you, Liu, my co-host for today. Thank We are so uh, yeah, glad to have Raja. Dr. Zubin here with us. Raja. Uh, yeah, Professor Zubin. Uh, today we have, uh, uh, I, I tell you the number, yeah, the sure. audience yes. from which it's uh, 3,436 now. Oh my God, that is a yeah. <laughs> huge <laughs> number. <laughs> a lot of audience, yeah. A lot of audience. Professor Mao Ying is yeah, a yeah, very yeah. famous person, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. So, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, thank for you. joining. Thank you again, Professor Mao Ying. Thank you, Professor Kondo. And thank you, Professor Zubin.